Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar. My name is Lucy Moore and I'm a Professional Education Manager at ACCA. Our session today is designed to support your preparation for the Financial Management or FM exam by debriefing key questions from a new mock exam available on the ACCA practice platform. And I'm really pleased to be joined by expert tutor Joe Tuffell. Hi, welcome everybody. I'm Jo Tuffle. I'm so excited to be here today to help you with this FM mock debrief. Please ask me lots of questions because this is all about you, not about me. I just wanted to introduce myself for, for a bit. I'm a management accounting expert and I've actually taught on ACCA courses for 15 years now. I am passionate about supporting students and I'm even more passionate about getting you to do mock exams. You were, will have seen some stats about, which basically says that you're more likely to pass by 17% more likely to pass if you do a mock exam. So, you know, it really is a game changer. So I'm really, really pleased to hear that 60% plus have done this mock exam. And um, hopefully you, you did get a lot out of it and you will have learned from that. So now let's, go through that mock in detail. I'm not going to do a lot. Um, I'm not going to do all the questions. Obviously, we don't have time for them. So I've selected some. So let's have a look at the agenda that we're going to go through. So first of all, I'm going to go through some tips for approaching financial management. Then I'm going to give you some debriefs of the new mock exams, some from section A, B and C. Then we're going to have an overall Q&A. But as Lucy said, I'll be answering questions while the debrief videos are going on. So please send them in. Don't wait till the end. So first of all, the tips for approaching FM. So they are pitfalls, really, rather than tips, I suppose. So it's thinking that you can pass on the numbers. Now, what you've will have noticed if you've done this mock exam, and I've done a little calculation here, is it's 48% calculation and 52% discursive. So you can't just rely on being able to calculate. You have to be able to write, and you have to be able to write well, not just state, but also explain your answers to get those marks. The other pitfall is thinking that you can pass in the MCQs. Now, you should know by now there's 60 marks on the paper for them. And so if you're thinking that you can pass by doing the MCQs and avoiding Section C written parts, then you'll be sadly deluded because uh, that means you're going to have to get 83% on those MCQs to get that 50% pass mark. So really don't just focus on the MCQs. You've got to also focus on those Section C questions. The other pitfall is thinking you can question spot. We all love a whack question. We all love an MPV question. And students tend to want those questions, but you're not going to guarantee it. I've also worked out um, of the from the syllabus, um, the Section C syllabus is for working capital, investment appraisal, it's business finance. And I thought there was like, if I looked at all the types of questions, I reckon there's about 15 types of questions that can come up within those three topics. So you can't question spot. You can't say, oh, I know WAC perfectly and I know net present value perfectly. I should be okay. They're likely to come up. They're not because if, again, if you go back and have a look at the previous sample papers that have just been released, and if you look back at the last three that were released, there isn't a net present value question in there, a full net present value question. There's a little part of a net present value question. But looking back, we've tested economic order quantity. Um, we've tested equivalent annual cost. They've tested um, capital rationing in the net present value area, okay, the investment appraisal area. And in the... Um, business finance area, we've kind of been looking at things like more like a project specific cost of capital, for instance, rather than a full WAC calculation. And they've done lots of business expansion questions and deciding whether you're going to expand with finance, um, which type of finance you're going to expand with. So debt finance or equity finance. 
So you can't rely on your perfect question to come up. You have to cover the whole syllabus and you have to think about making sure that you are technically up to date on all of it, not just the ones you like. So those are my pitfalls. Now, this is my approach. So the way I would approach the exam is to have a game plan. You need to have a game plan. It's so important. Are you going to go ABC or are you going to go DBA or are you going to go ACB? Now, those are, that's the important thing. What I find with students, if they do the ABC route, they tend to run out of time and they don't give that section C the time it deserves. So my, I mean, it's up to you. I don't want you to definitely stick with me if you have a game plan that works for you, but I always find it's better to do A, C and then B. Get yourself settled on those first 15 questions in section A. Go on to section C and give it the time it deserves so that you don't run out of time because you spent too much time finishing A and B. Then go into section B. B is traditionally one of the harder sections because it's a scenario based MCQs. And so I would definitely make sure that you get your section C done first. Time management. You know that you've got three hours allocate the right amount of time to each section. So section A needs 54 minutes, B 54 minutes and C 72 minutes. Don't go over time, allocate it carefully. What I would do in section A is in terms of time management is I, you look at it as 15, as the questions that are there, the 15 questions, but some of them will take longer than others. So you may go over time on one of the MCQs. You may take more than 3.6 um, minutes to go to do it because it's a long calculation. But then you could go on to a discursive question and that takes you far less time. So if there's some that you feel are going to take you a long time and you go, oh, I'm feeling quite stressed because I'm running out of time, make, flag that one. Go and do the easier, well, not easier, do the quicker questions and then come back and then you'll find that you're a little bit more settled and you can calmly go through that calculation and make sure you get it right. I think with the section B questions, don't look again as those as individual questions. Look as those as three 18 minute questions so that when you're doing them, you'll give it each, each scenario question 18 minutes. OK, because again, within those scenario questions, there'll be a couple of questions which will take far longer than the others. So don't worry if you're going over time, i.e. again, 3.6 minutes for the two marks. Make sure you um, think about, oh, well, you know, it's going to take less time to do a couple of the others so I can team and laid, as it were. So, but stick to the 18 minutes. And then section C, you must make sure you stick to time. Now, these questions have been written uh, and done to time on the practice platform to make sure you can do them to time. So obviously using a spreadsheet is going to be quicker than if you were writing it out and having to use a calculator to add it up. So you need to use the spreadsheet functionality to get through the question to time. OK. Now, my next point is bet to win. What do I mean by that? Well, one of the parts of the FM syllabus, which you should know, is futures. And the whole point, the whole point about futures if you're, is you're making a bet. And what I'm saying here is, you know those subjects you don't like and you're just going to go, I really don't want one of those to come up. If that comes up, oh, just not my cup of tea. What you need to do is bet to win. So what you have to go through that question. You have to learn it. You have to practice it. And then if it comes up a bit like a future, then you win because you've practiced it. But if it doesn't come up and you get a subject you like, then of course you win also, and therefore you're gonna do well. So either way, you've got to bet to win. So cover those awful questions that you don't like and make sure that you're ready for them. Um, my other point here is to learn theory. Now, what do I mean by that? Do not learn answers. Do not learn, wrote, learn answers to questions. 
that's what students do a lot. I want you to learn the theory so that you can apply the theory to the question that's asked. There's lots of questions out there, similar questions, and they're all asked in slightly different ways. So if you learn the answer, you might be answering a question you'd done a week ago, but that's not the question that the ACCA exam is asking. And I have an example of that later on for you. So don't rote learn answers, learn theory and practice applying that theory to the question that's asked and the scenario. Also, look out for those distractors. I'm telling students all the time, you may have got the right answer in the MCQ, but how about working out those distractors? They're there for a reason. If you can spot how they've calculated the distractor, you're more likely to spot them in the real exam under pressure and think, ah, that's, my, that's a distractor. I need to make sure that I recalculate and check that I'm going to get the right answer. It's little things like not like, you, like using 360 days instead of 365 days. Make sure you read carefully because that distractor will be there for you to pick and therefore you'll lose the two marks. And then my final point is practice on the platform. This is why we've done this mock. This is why the mock is on the platform for you, because we're so keen for you to practice on the platform. You can't do a test without practicing on that platform. You've got to be aware of what's going on and, and all the little techniques that you're going to be able to use in the exam to increase your chances of passing. You wouldn't take a driving test without, te without driving the car that you're going to take the test in. So don't do this with the practice platform. It's things like making sure that you label and you define your workings. You know, if you do that and there are own figure rules to be given, they will be easily followed through for, by the marker and you'll get them. If you don't label them and don't show us how you calculate those figures, then those own figure rules just won't come. Make sure you use headings in the word processor. Are you separate? the parts or points. So if a question has three parts to it, then use a heading to answer each of those parts. So it's clear to the marker which bit you're answering and they can allocate points. Separate out points because again, that is easier for the marker to see your separate points and allocate those marks. So above all practice, have a game plan, and make sure you stick to time. I think those are the three most important points. So now we're going to move on to the mock debrief videos. So the mock debrief, these are the sections I'm going to be looking at with you today. In section A, I'm looking at five MCQ questions. And there's interest, right, interest in Forex, risk management, asset and equity betas, cash management, and then valuation of debt areas of the syllabus. And then there's a business valuation question in section B that I'm going to debrief. And then the working capital question in section C I'm going to debrief. So this, remember, this mock is a practice mock for you. It's not past exam questions. This is for you to practice. And so what I want you to realize is this doesn't necessarily, which I have seen a lot of chat about on social media, this doesn't necessarily mean this is what's coming up in the FM exam. Please remember that. It is just a sample questions for you to be able to practice. So don't think that these are the questions that are coming up in the exam, which I'm sure you're not, but just in case, please don't think that. So let's move on to the first debrief video, which is the Section A mock debrief. So I'm going to start with question four, Willox Company. Now, Willox Company is from the weighted average cost of capital area of the syllabus. And if you read the requirement, first of all, it says, what is the appropriate equity beta to use in CAPM to one decimal place note and assume the debt beta is zero and that there is no tax. We need to find the formula to de-gear a beta and then re-gear a beta. And so 
we need to go to our formula sheet. And here is the formula. It's the asset beta formula. However, they have told us that debt is zero. So we don't need the second part of that formula. We just need the first part. And again, they've also told us is tax is zero. So again, we simplify that formula. So I'm going to write that down up here for you. B to A equals VE, which is the market value of equity. Uh, the market value of equity plus the market value of debt. And because tax is zero, I don't need to put that one minus T in. I therefore just need to times by B to E. So now let's read through the scenario. Willock's company is looking to invest in a project which has a different business risk. It has decided to use the capital asset pricing model to find an appropriate equity cost of capital. It has found an equity beta from a company with a similar business area to the project. And so we have a proxy beta value of 1.5, a proxy company gearing, and then Willux company gearing equity to debt of 3.2. So first of all, we need to de-gear the proxy and then we need to re-gear the beta A. To de-gear the proxy, we need to use the proxy company's gearing. Remember, equity is two and debt is one. Make sure you get that the right way round. Read that carefully. It's the ratio of E to D, which is two to one. And the re-gear, the beta, would be therefore E equals three and D equals two. So we'll start with beta A is going to be two over 2 plus 1 times by beta E. It's going to be 2 thirds times by beta E. And beta E is 1.5. And therefore, beta A will equal 1. Now we've got to re-gear. Now, the simplest way to re-gear is to reverse the formula. Put the bottom on the top. So now, beta E equals VE plus VD over VE times by beta A. Now to find beta E, we're going to look at Willock's company gearing, which is here, 3 to 2. So it's 3 plus 2 over 3 times by the 1, which we got from proxy beta A. So 5 over 3 times 1 is 1.66 recurring. And we've been asked to put it to one decimal place. So be careful, it needs to go to 1.7. And there we have it, we have the answer there, 1.7. So let's just discuss those distractors. 0 0.6 would be the answer if you'd done part two wrong, if you hadn't reversed the formula. So you would times the beta A by three over five instead of five over three. And the 1.3 would be the answer if you'd got debt and equity mixed up. And then 1.5 is just the proxy equity beta value. And you hadn't done any de-gearing or re-gearing. OK, so now we're on question seven. And this is a discursive question in the risk management area of the syllabus, specifically interest rates. Now, we've got three statements here, and they're asking us which ones are true. You've got three options there, so we'll have a look at those in turn. The first option says a negative interest rate gap occurs when interest-sensitive liabilities maturing at a certain time are greater than interest-sensitive assets maturing at that time. Well, let's have a look at the theory about that. So the interest rate gap is defined as interest sensitive assets minus interest sensitive liabilities. So that is correct. We've just got to decide whether it's negative. And it's negative if the interest sensitive liabilities are greater than the assets. So therefore, that is true. Now, number two says an inverted yield curve can be a sign of upcoming recession. Well, let's draw the yield curve the normal yield curve, and then discuss what happens when it's inverted. So here is the normal yield curve. Interest rates are increasing with the term of the debt. So an inverted yield curve would look like this. So here, interest rates would be falling 
with the term of the debt. Now, one of the theories of the yield curve, and there are three, remember, is expectations theory. The other one is liquidity preference theory, and the other one is market segmentation theory. Well, this one is all about expectations theory. And if we see the yield curve increasing with the term, we would be expecting interest rates to be going up and therefore that would be a sign of a boom. If it's inverted, that means we're expecting interest rates to go down in the future, and that would be a sign of a recession. So number two is true. Then number three says liquidity preference theory is where investors have a preference for shorter maturity investments and will therefore expect those investments to have a higher yield. Well, liquidity preference does say that investors do have a preference for shorter mature investments, but that demand means that the yield would be lower. It's actually the opposite. The yield would be higher on the longer term investments to compensate investors for investing over a longer period of time. So number three is not true. The answer is one and two only. So the next question is question 13. And here you have to find the current market value of the debt to the nearest dollar. So a company has some redeemable debt with the following features. The coupon rate, which is the interest rate on the debt, is 8%. And it's redeemable in eight years' time, so that's the term of the debt. And it's redeemable at a premium of 10%. So remember, the nominal value of debt that's traded is always $100. So the premium works off the 100, and therefore a 10% premium would mean it's redeemable at $110. The required return for the investor is 7% and the tax rate is 30%. There's your first distractor. The investor receives the pre-tax rate at 7%. And so we don't require that 30%. That is when we're calculating the cost of debt to the company. So when we find this current market value of the debt, we're looking at the cash flows that the investor will receive. So I'll lay that out for you. We will then need to find the present value of those cash flows by using the discount tables to find the discount factors and the annuity factors. So the first cash flow to note down is the interest receivable. That will be 8% on a $100 loan note. And they're redeemable in eight years time. So we're receiving that from years one to eight. So that'll be $8. The next thing they receive is in year eight, the premium on redemption, which we've already said is $110. We now need to find the discount factors to find the present value of those cash flows. So let's refer to the tables. So the first factor we need is the discount rate to apply to the redemption value. And that is at 7% for eight years. So that'll be 0.582. Then we go to the annuity table and we look at the annuity factor at 7% for eight years, which is 5.971. Then we now times the interest by the annuity factor, which is 47.768. And the 110 by the present value factor is 64.02. We total them up and we'll get 111.788. Now, remember, we have to put that into the nearest dollar. So the nearest dollar is 112. Let's pop that into the answer. So I've put that in as 112. But just see if you did try and put that in in dollars and cents, which would have been 111 point. Oh, I'm not allowed to put a point in. So therefore, that is good. It will remind you. So let's put that back to what we want it to be, which is 112. So we're now on question 14, 
And this is from the cash management part of the syllabus. You're being required to use the Miller-Orr model. Now the Miller-Orr model is a formula on your formula sheet. But let's read the question first and then we'll go and look at the formula. So using the Miller-Orr model, what is the maximum cash balance that should be set by the business? Now let's look at the narrative. The business decides to use the Miller-Orr cash management model to ensure that it holds an appropriate amount of cash at all times. It wishes to keep a minimum cash balance of 15,000 to ensure its daily cash needs are covered. So that's the lower level. Every time it transfers money to and from its short-term investments, there's a fixed fee of $25. So that's the transaction fee. And then we have a standard deviation of cash flows, which is 5,000 per day. And the interest rate is 0.01% per day. Okay, so now let's have a look at the formula. So you've got two formulas under the miller or model. The return point, which is the lower limit plus one third of the spread. Now we were given our lower limit in that question. It was 15,000. The question asked us to find the maximum point, which would actually be the lower limit plus the spread. And the spread is there for you to use those variables given in the question to calculate it. So let's show you how to use that formula. So I've written out the formula for you and now we're going to complete it. So the spread is going to be three times and I've written three quarters as 0.75. Transaction cost is 25. And then the variance we get from the standard deviation of cash flows, which is 5,000 per day. And the variance would be the standard deviation squared. So 5,000 squared. And then you divide it by the interest rate, which is 0.01%, the daily one. That needs to go in as a decimal. So you need to divide that by 100, which would be 0.0001. And don't forget to do the brackets to a third. So I've called up the online calculator to show you how to do this. You need to do it in stages. So you'll start with the top line in brackets, 0.75 times by 25 times by 5,000 squared equals a rather large number. And then you divide by, remember, 0.0001. Again, equals, and ignore that because it'll come out okay in the end. And then you do little hat to the one over three, enter. And then that needs to be then times by three. And there's your answer for the spread. Now note, there's one of the distractors. It says 5207. One of the answers there is 5207. That is a distractor. It's the spread. Remember, you need to find the maximum limit, not the spread. So therefore, we need to add on the lower limit. So I've added on 15,000, which is the lower limit, and we now have got 65207. So there's your answer. Let's just run through the other distractors. The 15633 would be the answer that you get if you'd put the standard deviation in instead of the variance, and you'd also put the daily interest rate in at 0.01. The 31736 is if you hadn't times the bracket answer, which is the 16735 by the 3. If you'd left it at 16735 and then added 15,000, that would be the return point, which is the other formula given to you in the formula sheet. Those distractors are there to distract. You do need to double check your workings. So the final question I'm going to look at in section A is question 15. This is also from the risk management area of the syllabus, but this time it's from the foreign exchange area. So let's have a look at the requirement. It says working to the nearest $100, what is the dollar value 
of the expected receipt in six months' time. Well, if you look at the scenario, this is all about a hedge, a money market hedge. This is a technique that you do need to practice. It's a common area to be tested because it involves four calculations to get to the answer. So let's now pick out some of the areas to note. Art Company is a US company. It's due to receive 996,000 euros from one of its customers in six months time. So it's a US company. That means the base country is the US and the base currency is the dollar. So the foreign market is Europe and euros. And they hedge is for six months time so we need to ensure that when we take any interest rates, we halve them. So if they're an annual rate, they need to be converted into a six month rate. We've been given the current spot. Now it's good here, we haven't been given the forward rate to distract us because when we do a money market hedge, we always use the spot rate, not the forward rate. And that's a common distractor. So watch out for that in future questions. We've been given Two sets of interest rates, a deposit rate and a borrowing rate for each market. So we now need to set up the hedge. When you're receiving foreign money, that means that's the foreign market. And you need to set up a money market hedge that would be a liability. So you will borrow in the foreign market. So therefore, we need the borrowing rate in euros. We will then do the opposite in the base country, i.e. the dollar, the US. And therefore, we need a deposit in the US currency, and that would be at 5%. The exchange rate has been given to you with the foreign currency to the base currency. So therefore, to convert from euros to dollars, we would need to divide by that rate. So here, I'm setting up my hedge so that I can calculate in one go, the outcome. I've got the foreign market on the right and the base market on the left. Remember I said that we're going to borrow in the foreign market and we're going to deposit in the base market. We now need our rates. So if we're borrowing in the euro, then we need the 4.5 per annum. But remember this is for six months, so we need to convert that to a six month rate. We're going to deposit in the base currency, which is the US, and therefore we take 5% and divide by 2. Finally, we put in our spot rate. Now we're going to follow the arrows round with the calculations. We're going to divide, divide, times. And remember, with the interest rate, you will be dividing by 1 plus R and timesing by 1 plus R. So it would be 1.0225 and 1.025. Now using the online calculator, we can do this all in one go. It's 996 and three zeros divided by 1.0225 divided by 0 0.94 times by 1.025. And the answer comes out as 1062165. We've got to do it to the nearest 100. And so the answer is 1062200. Let's again have a look at those distractors. So the first distractor being the 1064600, you you'd have got that result if you've done everything correctly, except you didn't make the interest rates six monthly. You left them as annual rates. The next distractor, 1059600, you would have got if you'd simply taken the receipt of 996,000 and converted it at the spot rate by dividing by 0 0.94. The final one is if you'd used the rates the wrong way round. So you basically got the hedge the wrong way round. Please make sure you check your workings and double check that you have the hedge the right way round. Remember, if you're receiving a receipt in foreign currency, then you need to borrow in that foreign market. If you're paying in a foreign currency, then you'll need to deposit in that market. 
and then you will be successful at these questions. Thank you for listening. So the Q&A, um, I've been answering lots of questions on the um, on those mock um, questions for the MCQ section A. One of the main questions that came up is the question when we were doing the valuation of the uh, bond uh, for the investor. And a lot of people were misunderstanding the fact that we didn't use that tax rate. That tax rate is a corporation tax rate, and that's for the company. We use that tax deduction when we calculate the cost of debt. When we're calculating the market value of debt, we don't use that tax deduction because it's from the investor's point of view. And they get interest, which is pre-tax. And so the valuation of bond has to be used for pre-tax. And so you must remember that. That is a really, val really valuable technique. These questions come up all the time. Um, so that was one of the main questions. Right, I'm going to now have a look at the next one, which is this section B mock debrief. Now, this is the valuation question, the business valuation question. I got a question earlier also on the fact that risk management and business valuations are tested mainly in the MCQ section of the syllabus. Now, that is clearly stated in the syllabus that um, they are tested in the MCQ sections. However, I'm, you know, I'm not going to say that you're definitely not going to get some sort of question in section B. You won't get a calculation, but you might have to refer to uh, a theory in those two areas. So don't rely on it. I mean, you can pretty much rely on it being a, a, a big question in an MCQ. So one of the cases, for instance, from the risk management area or the business valuations area. But uh, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't, I would ne definitely not see it as a full section C question. No, so that's the right answer. Okay, so <laughs> let's move on to the section B mock debrief. So the question Kenal Company has five parts, and that means there's 10 marks going for this question. You need to see this question as the full 18 minutes because it will take some time to read the scenario and then work out which of the five questions it relates to. And also some of the questions may take longer than the 3.6 minutes and some may be shorter. And so you need to see the whole question as 18 minutes. So let's read the scenario. Can our company is looking to take over another company, Culey Company? And so it needs to value Culey in order to put together a takeover bid. It has gathered the following information. Cooley's earnings last year were 460,000, but this was after a deduction of a one-off bad debt of 50. So if we read through that bit, they're talking about adjustments potentially to those earnings, and then they're also giving you an earnings yield figure of 13%. The next paragraph then talks about it has non-current assets on its books with an historic value of 5.5 million. It then gives you some further information about adjustments to those for replacement cost and an outstanding debt. It then talks about some bonds that are still in issue and need to be redeemed. So the second paragraph is all about earnings. The third paragraph is all about assets. And then the fourth paragraph talks about if the takeover of Cooley falls through, they've also targeted a property development company, Corkill. They want to run that as a going concern and the future growth is strongly anticipated to be in line with growth over the past years. And then finally, the managing director has recently heard that an old colleague has been jailed for insider trading. He knows that the rules on insider trading are needed because of the efficiency level of the stock market. So the final paragraph is all about the efficiency of the stock market. And remember, there are four levels of that. So as we now go through the questions, you need to relate the question to the paragraph in the scenario. So first one here says, using earnings yield, what is a valuation for Cooley Company from the information provided. So that is looking at paragraph two. 
Now let me call up my scratch pad and calculator. Now the earnings yield is one of the three bases for valuing companies, being assets basis, earnings basis, and cash flow basis. And the earnings basis has two potential ways of doing it. You can either use a PE ratio or the earnings yield. Now remember, effectively, the earnings yield is the reciprocal of the PE ratio. One divides into the earnings and one would times into earnings. So the earnings yield we need to use as a decimal and we divide it into earnings. Now the earnings that we use will be the prior year earnings, but we will need to adjust them for those known one-offs and changes. So the earnings last year were 460. We add back that one-off bad debt of 50. And then we look at the excessive salary. We must add that back too and then replace it with the new salary. This will give us the adjusted earnings. And in our calculator, that is now 620. I just need to make sure I convert that to dollars because if you see, all the answers are in dollars. We now take that 620 and we divide it by the 13% but we need to use the 13% as a decimal. And using my calculator, the answer will be 4769.2307. We need to convert that to dollars, and you should see the answer is therefore 4769.231. Let's now understand those distractors. The first distractor being the 3538462, would be if you'd simply taken the 460 and divided by 0.13. The next distractor would be if you'd only added back the 50 and then divided by the 0.13. And then the final distractor is if you'd just accounted for the managing director's excessive salary and the replacement salary. So don't forget they're all there to distract. So please check carefully before you fall for them. OK, so the next question, question 22, is a discursive question. We need to select two of the following pieces of information. And we need to select the ones which would be needed to calculate a discounted cash flow valuation for Cooley Company. So when we look and select which ones they are, you need to bear in mind it's cash flows and you're discounting them. So the first one says synergies after the takeover. Well, that is correct because they are cash flows. Synergies are cash that you will save as a result of merging. Things like the fact that you will get rid of a head office and therefore you will save lease costs, for example. So that is correct. The next one is profits on disposal of assets post takeover. That's not correct because of the term profits. It's cash that matters for the discounted cash flow valuation, not profits. They're accounting values. The next one is appropriate discount rate. As we're using a discounted method, then of course that would be correct. The final two, an existing price earnings ratio. That's not correct. We'd be using that when we look at the earnings method of valuation. And then budgets for the past two years is irrelevant. We would be looking at a forecast of cash flows, not a budget from the past. So the answers are synergies and appropriate discount rate. Then we move on to question 23. It says here, using asset values, so we're now looking at the asset valuation, what is the valuation for Cooley Company from the information provided to the nearest 100,000? So we've got four choices there, and don't forget some of them will be distractors. So we're looking at paragraph three here, and the information there tells us that we're looking at it from a replacement cost basis. So there are three bases for asset valuations. There's the book value, which is based on historic accounting. There's the net realizable value, which would be on a breakup basis, a liquidation basis, what you could sell the assets for. 
And then there would be a replacement cost valuation, which is where we're taking over a company as a going concern. And that would be appropriate for this. I've called up my scratch pad here to help you do this calculation. So for an assets basis, remember we take the assets minus the liabilities, which leaves us with equity. So the first asset in that paragraph talks about the non-current assets at their book value of 5.5 million, but they've been recently put at a current replacement cost 20% higher. So we need to apply 20% onto that cost, and that will give us 6.6 .6 million. The next one is the current assets, and it includes a long outstanding debt of 50. So we need to take that long outstanding debt, which is unlikely to be paid, off the 1.2, and that leaves us with 1.15 million. And finally, we have the loan notes. These have a nominal value of 1.35 million, but they're due to be redeemed at 5% premium next year. We need to take them off at that premium because that's what we're paying them off at. And therefore, that would reduce our equity. So they will be redeemed at 1.4175 million. So we're now ready to calculate the net assets figure. So using the calculator, it comes out as 6332.5. Remember, we need to put it to the nearest 100,000. So therefore, it's answer two. Now, again, looking at the distractors, if you'd pick the first answer, 5.3, this would have been if you hadn't applied that uplift to the non-current assets and you'd taken the loan notes off at their nominal value. Next distractor, the 6.4, would be if you'd done everything correctly and set the loan notes and you took them off at nominal value. And the final one will be if you really hadn't understood how to do this net assets valuation and you simply took the assets and you didn't add the 20% on cost and you only took off the 50. And that would have given you the 6.65 million. Now we're on the next question, question 24. And this says, which two of the following would be appropriate valuation methods for Corkill Company? Now, if you look at paragraph four, it says that Kenal Company has also targeted a property development company, Corkill Company, as a takeover instead if Cooley Company falls through. Now, they're looking to run that business as a going concern after the takeover. And the future growth is anticipated to be strong. So they're operating this as a going concern and they're taking over the whole company. So when we look at the options, the first two are not correct because the business is going to be run as a going concern and not broken up to sell the assets, which is what the net realizable value would be. And as it's a takeover rather than the purchase of a minority shareholding, using the dividend growth model or dividend valuation model would not be a valid way because they're purchasing a majority shareholding. So it's the final two, the price earnings valuation and the discounted cash flow valuation, which would be appropriate because these relate to majority holdings and they rely on accurate predictions of future earnings and cash flows. And the final question in this section B question on business valuation it's question 25, and this question is all about market efficiency. Now, market efficiency means how efficient is the stock market at valuing shares of a company? And so the efficient market hypothesis shows that there's varying levels of efficiency in the speed and accuracy of repricing shares as new information becomes available. This particular question is looking at insider trading. So if you go and look again at paragraph five, the managing director has recently heard that an old colleague has been jailed for participating in insider trading. He knows that the rules on insider trading are needed because of the efficiency level of the stock market. So the question therefore asks us, what is the highest efficiency level 
for which rules against insider trading would be needed. Now, there's four options there. Not efficient means the stock market isn't efficient at repricing. Weak form efficiency means that share prices reflect all the historical share price movements. And therefore, investors can make excess profits through chartist techniques, which is called technical analysis. Now, semi-strong form efficiency means it's as the weak form, but also reflects all publicly available information. So if you perform fundamental analysis, which means examining publicly available information, this will not provide opportunities to consistently beat the market. It's only if you have inside information that you can beat the market, which is called inside dealing. So the maximum level is therefore semi-strong because you can do insider dealing with weak and not efficient, but they're asking for the highest level of efficiency. Strong form efficiency means that all information is available to everyone and therefore is automatically priced into the shares. So you won't be able to take advantage of insider dealing and therefore you don't need any rules against it. So your answer is semi-strong form efficiency. Thank you for listening. OK, so hopefully you find that valuable. I've been answering lots of questions on this one. I have got a particular question that somebody has asked me on the earnings yield part of that question. And I think this is because you've seen previous questions in the past where you've been given um, an earnings growth percentage. Well, that was when we used to test it in Section C and there was two answers given. Um, where you could use the growth or you could just use the earnings yield without the growth. And so basically now it's tested in section B, it's only ever used without the growth. So you just take the earnings yield and you don't need to take a, into account the growth in earnings. We do, however, still use the growth, obviously, in the dividend valuation model. So when you're using the valuation for dividends, then you need to put the growth in. So I'm now going to move on to our final section, which is the section C mock debrief. So here we have Damarel Company. Damarel Company is a working capital question and it has three requirements. Two are discursive and one is a calculation. Having a look at the scenario now, you can see you've got some statement of financial position extracts showing the non-current assets and the working capital. Two notes beneath the statement of financial position extracts. The first one is telling us all about the current assets and how much we have as buffer inventory, how much the receivable balance fluctuates with its lowest and the cash balance fluctuates with its lowest. This is telling us these are permanent current assets. The second note is telling us all about a supplier discount offer. Let's now have a look at the first requirement. The first requirement says discuss the different strategies for funding working capital and from the figures determine which strategy Damarel Company has adopted. This is for nine marks. So the first part of the requirement is to discuss and the second is to use some analysis to come up with the strategy that Damarel has adopted for funding their working capital. And here is the marking scheme. It's very clear where all those nine marks come from, but there is a pitfall. And it's the discussion of permanent versus fluctuating current assets. You can't explain those three approaches, aggressive, conservative and balanced approach or matching easily unless you understand the difference between permanent and fluctuating current assets. Because permanently in the business is the base level and fluctuating is seasonal. You then need to go on to the analysis of Damarel and those calculation marks. So here I have a real student answer for you, which I'm marking on the practice platform. We can look again here at the marking scheme and allocate the marks from it. So as I can see, they've detailed three strategies 
They've then talked about the cheapest form of finance as an overdraft, and that keeps costs low. They've then done some analysis on Damarel's strategy, and they've come up with a solution to their approach. What they haven't done, though, is those first two marks. They have not explained permanent and fluctuating. So they'll get zero marks for that. They have done a bit of a discussion based on risks and costs. And so I'm going to allocate half a mark for that. They then have discussed the three strategies in their own words, which are all correctly explained. So one mark each. And then when we come to the analysis of the strategy, they have done some analysis based on the total current assets and the total current liabilities. And they've looked at the fact that the current liabilities is funding 31% of the current assets. Now, this is not strictly the analysis that we wanted. We wanted them to use the permanent current assets in the business to work out the strategy. So if we look again at the question, you'll see here, these are the permanent current assets in the business. And they should have added those together and compared them to the current liabilities. Looking at the model answer, you can see that this would mean that 3.3 is permanent in the business, and that would leave 1.475 as fluctuating. And as the fluctuating matches the current liabilities of 1.5, then that would mean we're funding the fluctuating current assets with short-term funds being current liabilities. And therefore, we must be funding the remaining, which are the permanent current assets, with long-term funds. This would mean they're using a matching approach to funding. This candidate has come up with a conservative strategy, but they will still get some own figure rule marks for this. So I'm going to allocate them half a mark for their calculation and half a mark for their answer. But that would be an own figure rule. So overall, this candidate has scored half marks on this. The second requirement is to evaluate whether Demorel company should accept the early settlement discount offer from its main supplier. All the information you need is in that second paragraph. Now you're used to doing this from the receivables point of view, but this is from the trade payables point of view, and this will need practice. There is a past exam question called NASUD company, which is in practice exam one. So you should go and have a look at this after doing this mock. Here is the marking scheme. There's five marks going. Again, we need to look at the own figure rules here. If the change in payables is incorrect, that will affect the increase in the finance cost and also the net benefit of accepting the discount. So those are own figure rules that should be followed through. Finally, if it changes the comment on your financial acceptability and it's different from the model answer, but it's correct based on your answer, then you get that mark. So here again, we have an example student script. On the left is the paragraph that we need to answer the question. And it says the credit terms from its main supplier is 30 days, but it's been paying on average at 40. Purchases from this supplier are 3 million per year. And Demorel has been offered a discount of half a percent if it pays within 15 days. The administration cost will increase by 600 per year if the early settlement discount is taken. Damarel's funding costs for working capital are 6% and assume 360 days per year. Always read to the end of the question. So if we look at what this candidate's done, they've used the spreadsheet functionality beautifully. It's clearly laid out, it's clearly labeled, and I can see the follow through calculations to be able to give them some follow through or own figure marks. So now let's allocate those marks. That settlement discount has been calculated accurately and that gets one mark.
principles now says it's 30 days. Now that might be the credit terms, but that's incorrect. It's the 40 days that we should be using to compare with the 15. They've also used 365 days instead of 360. However, they have correctly used the 3 million purchases to calculate the total payables that requires funding. So the calculation for the drop in funding is correct based on their figures, and then they've applied the 6%. So we can give an own figure rule for that finance cost. They get zero marks for the change in payables, but they then also get an own figure rule for the net benefit. They've missed out the administration costs increase, therefore losing half a mark. And they've also not really commented effectively on whether it's acceptable. They've just said yes. But I'm not going to give a mark for that. You need to be writing a whole sentence. So in summary, they've received one mark for the settlement discount, zero marks for the payables because they incorrectly used the 30 and 365. They received an own figure rule mark for the finance cost correctly using their own figure. And again, the net benefit is correctly calculated based on their figures, but without the 600 administration cost increase. They didn't say properly that it was financially acceptable. So overall, they're going to get two and a half marks. Finally, we come to C. This is for six marks. This is a really open-ended question. It says, discuss the difficulties that small and medium-sized businesses can come across when sourcing funding. There is a lot to say on this. And the marking scheme reflects this, so you'll have to plan your answers carefully. There are many more marks here than six. In fact, there's 10 marks going. You need to be careful when you're marking this for yourself. Don't expect that your answer should match the model answer. It's the marking scheme that matters. And if you've written something in your own words and it doesn't match the model answer, you will still be given credit for them. Now, there is a technical article on SME funding that you should read. This would really help you with this question. OK, so this is the final part of the student answer. Remember, the question is discuss the difficulties that small and medium sized businesses can come across when sourcing funding. So you need to discuss the difficulties and answer the question. Now, this student has tried to do that. They've said the difficulties are they are seen as risky. And they've explained in four points why they're risky. However, we don't like bullet points. We like full sentences. And so really, they should be explaining that limited track record with a full sentence. And they should also be explaining they don't have assets to use as security as a full sentence. If you look at the model answer, they have explained it. Here, the risk to the investor is also increased because businesses often do not have a proven track record and their accounts will not have been scrutinized as much as those of a quoted business. You just need to explain your points and not state your points. If we then move on to those two sentences below their points, they've also said they have a funding gap because they're not seen as an interactive investment. You haven't really explained what the funding gap is to fully get the mark for that. Although it's obvious to you, it's not obvious to the marker that you know what the funding gap is. So define it and then you'll get the mark. The funding gap is the difference between what small, medium sized enterprises desire as financing for their investments and what they're able to achieve from external investors. The candidate then goes on to say they're not large enough to float on the stock market. That needs to be explained. So what? It means that they will struggle to raise equity finance from the markets. They'd have to look privately to venture capitalists or business angels. And then they go on to say getting loans are difficult because they require security. That is a good point. 
they don't have many assets available. And I think that point is clearly explained. So I'm going to allocate one mark to this risky and explain by the limited track record and the limited controls and don't have to be audited. I'm going to allocate one mark to the assets to use as security linking to this sentence here. I'm then going to allocate half mark here and a half mark here. So overall, they've achieved three out of the six marks, but it could have been so much better if they'd used full sentences. Thank you for listening to this Section C mock debrief. If you have any more questions on any of the sections A, B or C, then your chance to ask them is now. OK, I'm hoping you've enjoyed those and it's been clear to you. I've had quite a few questions, so I've been quite busy answering them, but I'll try and answer some more uh, in the main Q&A session for you. But I wanted to give you some sort of hind, um, insight on where you can go and do some further practice on the Section C question that I've just gone through. So question 20, 32, Damarel, these are some areas where you can go and do some further practice. So if you're wanting to understand working capital funding strategies and how the questions are asked, you can go and look at Dusty Company, which is in the September, December 2019 sample paper. You've got Pumas Company, which was from March, July 2020. And that one describes working capital investment and funding. And that was one of the questions I was asked. They have similar terminology, but they are described differently. So go and have a look at Pumas Company and you'll understand that in a bit more detail. And then you've got Nasud Company, which is a, basically a direct copy of this question on the supplier discount side. I did have a question that somebody's just asked me about that supply discount. Do we take into account the discount on the purchases figure when we're calculating the payable days? Now, I have seen that answer in um, questions in um, exam kits by providers, but the ACCA answer is basically done for trade receivables and payables is based on the undiscounted version of the sales and the purchases. So your answers should reflect that. Um, the technical article, Business Finance for SMEs, is also a podcast. And so that's really worth reading and understanding the risks, um, the issues that SMEs have. They have a funding gap and they have a maturity gap. And that explained really clearly in that technical article. It also goes through all the different types of financing available for FMEs, which is exactly what could be tested. And it was tested in Dink Company in September, December 2019. So you need to be able to describe some of the different types of funding that an SME can get. But please, please remember, do not rote learn it. I don't just write down everything you know answer the question because that particular question it from memory does say describe three okay so you don't need to describe six you'd need to describe three well to get those marks so don't just state them explain them and this is something that every time students need to get clear you don't state something you need to explain it so when you're um, in the working capital um, side of Demorel and we were explaining the working capital funding strategies, the question never told you what the funding strategies were. So you had to remember they were aggressive, conservative and matching. And so the marks are going for knowing that, but then describing it in your own words. OK. So hopefully that's give you some hints of where to go and do some extra practice. So now this is your turn. Now, the other question in the section C exam, um, part of this exam was a net present value question. And it was based on quite an old question back from 2014, I think from memory, um, where the accountant had basically done the, a junior accountant had basically done the net present value calculation incorrectly and you had to correct it. But I want you to focus on the written part of that question. And I have a poll for you here. 
So the reason part of that question was only for three marks, but we've seen this question time and time again in past exam, past exams. And this is an example for me to show you. This is where a student will have potentially le wrote, learnt an answer um, to a question and then decided to write that answer to this question without really focusing on what the question is asking. So this question is asking, if the project is to go ahead, the loan funding used would represent a significant increase in debt funding for high M company. Explain why this might make the current WAC inappropriate to use. Now, previous questions have said, explain why WAC may not be appropriate to use in project appraisal. That's a much more general question, okay? And so this student has wrote, learned that answer, and I'll show you. They've basically written that out. They've written business risk, finance risk, size of project. That's not answering this question. This question is specific about finance risk because it's increasing debt funding. So you need to, need, need to be careful about rote learning answers. You don't just think, oh, I've learned that. I did that question. I've got it off and throw it down. You need to apply the theory to the question that's asked. So have a little look at this question. What marks would you give this student bearing that in mind? You can give it him or she, sorry, three marks, two marks, one mark or zero marks. And then I'm going to post up the poll for you. So bear in mind, do you think they've answered the question that's been asked? OK. Or have they just answered the question they want it to be because they've wrote learned it? So I'll give you a few more 10 seconds or so just to read that and decide how many marks you'd give it. So it's three marks, two marks, one mark or zero marks. Right, I'm going to move on to the poll. So we have the overall majority going for one. We have the next would be giving them two and a minimal amount would be giving three and zero. So well done, the majority, because that's the answer that I would give this student. So I would give this student one mark. So I've marked this on the platform so you can see how this works. I know it seems weird, but <laughs> the little tick mark with a zero means they're not getting any marks for that. And they're just getting one mark for that final sentence. And this is why. So these are correct, right? So it is correct that business risk, finance risk and the size of the project should not change. And the small it should be a small project. But um, they aren't answering the question, are they? The question specifically asked about finance risk. And so these don't carry any marks. But also they're bullet points, aren't they? And we don't like bullet points. They need to be explained. So the question that they're getting the mark for, or the answer they're getting the mark for, is basically they've explained that increasing financial risk and work will need to be recalculated. But I want to know what is the actual effect of this in the WAC calculation. So please clarify to get more marks. So to get more marks, the student needs to say, explain the effect fully. Remember the traditional theory of capital structure. Proportionately more debt reduces WAC as it is cheaper, but WAC will increase due to the cost of equity increasing as shareholders see risk increasing. So that would therefore then got, get them up to the full three marks. So they're explaining that financial risk means the WAC is inappropriate because it's changing, needs to be recalculated. And then you need to explain why financial risk affects the WAC calculation using the traditional theory of capital structure. So well done those who all gave one mark. Hopefully you're learning that you need to write in full sentences and explain and the question that's actually asked. So further practice on high M company. I referred to that previous uh, past exam question, which was from December 2014. You should be able to find this in the approved learning providers exam kits. Um, so that's often company December 2014, which was redrafting the net present value and commenting on the errors. 
Vixen Company is from March, June 2017, and that is in the past papers in the ACCA uh, website under financial management resources. And it basically uses those expected values, which you expected to use in high M company with, um, with a net present value with inflation and tax. TUFA and Deanla company are those questions where I'm showing you discuss the circumstances it's appropriate to use WAC. Those were those rote learn answers in my previous example. So by all means, go and have a go at those questions, but make sure that you don't just rote learn. You think, right, I've learned the theory now. I need to apply it to the question. And then if you need some more understanding of optimal capital structure, then go and have a look at the technical article. So there's a whole host of resources and technical articles on the ACC website that you can use. And it's really important that you do use them. OK, so I think we're now on to the main Q&A. Great. OK, so firstly, thank you for that session. That's been fantastic. Um, you've you've managed to get through an incredible number of student questions as your videos were playing. So that's brilliant. Um, we have got some time now just to share some questions more widely. So I'm going to kick off by asking you a few questions that have come in around exam technique, um, exam approach. So some slightly more general questions. And then I'll ask you to, I've created a, a folder for technical questions in the Q&A box. Um, and I've been moving some of the things that have been coming through as you've just been on your last few slides. I've been moving those across. So I'll invite you to have a look in there. But if we just start with some of the more general questions that I mentioned, um, what I wanted to start off with now, I've, I've answered a number of questions that have come through on this and I, I can see you've done the same. But I think that the number of students asking this means it's important to to address it more widely um, and share the answer for everybody. So lots of students have been asking about whether they need to write out the formula that yet they're using. If they do use formula when they're answering a question, do they need to kind of write that out or can the markers see um, by interrogating the cells what formula they've used? And a kind of a, an, another side to that question is um, how far do they need to go in kind of labeling their, their workings when they're answering a calculation question? So kind of a two part question, if that's OK to start with that. Yeah, um, so I think it's really important, the labeling. And then when you're doing the formula, you will then refer to those labeled cells when creating the formula for the answer. So just to be clear, right, when you're doing a WAC calculation, for instance, I would lay out the WAC calculation, say if you had three sources of capital, I'd lay it out with my market values of each, my costs of each, and then obviously times the market values by the costs and add them up, add up both columns and then calculate the WAC. You don't need to then say the WAC formula. You just need to label the WAC equals and then click on the cell of the sum of the total market values and click on the cell of the sum of the costs. And then one divided by the other becomes your WAC. So that is obvious to the mark of what you've done because you've laid it out in a table. It's all very easy um, to follow. And then if you've made a mistake on the market value, for instance, for equity, because you may have got the uh, par value of the number of par value of the shares wrong, which is a common error, the marker can then follow that through as an own figure rule into your WAC calculation. So if the WAC calculation finally gets two marks, then those two marks are given to you, even if you get the market value of um, equity wrong. Yeah. So if you're then doing a calculation to get the cost of equity, say using the dividend valuation model, you would put that in a working beneath that table. And I would do definitions of cells. So I'd call um, D0, the dividend now, and I'd put a D0 next to it and put that figure in a cell. I'd put the growth rate in and label it uh, in a cell. And then I would um, put the, um, the market price of the share, current market, ex-div market price of a share in a cell. 
And then when I'm calculating the cost of equity using the dividend valuation model, I would call it cost of equity equals, and then I would just refer to those cells. So DO times by one plus G over PO, and then making, for, making sure you put the G back on the end, as I call it, the honey G at the end. So if you put that correctly into your cell, showing that formula, then that will be marked correctly and followed through. So any mistakes in your growth rate will get followed through and you'll get own figure rule marks if that was worth two marks, for instance. You lose the mark on the getting the growth rate wrong. Hopefully that's clear. Yeah. What do you Thanks, think, Lucy? Both. Yeah, that's really clear. Yeah, really clear. And I think just demonstrates the importance of, um, of labelling your work because doing so means that you could potentially earn those marks even if you have made a slight error. So that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, having a look at some more questions coming through um, that are just, you know, more slightly more general questions. So this one is a bit, it's a little bit asking how much to write to earn a certain number of marks, but I think it's also a little bit asking about layout so the quest the question is asking for section c questions if it was say a five mark question would they have to write a full paragraph for that or maybe explain their point write their answer in two or three lines separated by spaces so i think it's a combination of asking the amount you need to write yeah okay and also how yeah. what's the clearest way to lay things out so um for instance what you've got to think to yourself with a um, explain the discursive question explaining a point is you've got to make sure you explain I know it sounds that I'm just going to repeat myself explain it so if you want to make sure you're getting one point then I would separate out the points so for instance a good example of this is there was a recent exam question which said um, explain the um, advantages of using discounted cash flow methods now um, it says well, actually, it wasn't. It says discuss the advantage of using disc discounted cash flow methods. And so they, we wanted you to discuss the advantages of using them and perhaps the disadvantages of using them. But what we wanted you to particularly do when you do come up with an advantage is not to just state it. So let's just consider one point, for instance. If a student said to me, that uh, the advantage of using the discounted cash flow methods, net present value, for instance, and IRR, is they're based on cash flows, not profits. Do you think that I should be giving you a full mark for that? Do you not see that that is just stating? Yeah, that's stating. Um, I would ask Lucy, do you understand the answer to that question, Lucy? If I just said, is it cash flow versus profits? I'm not sure I'm the best person to ask because I'm not sure I'd yeah, understand it, even if it was explained point. fully. No, but, <laughs> but that's the point. The marker <laughs> doesn't know whether you really understand it by just stating profits versus cash flow. Yeah. What you have to explain, right, is that cash is an objective figure and it's actually used to pay shareholders returns, i.e. dividends. Profit can be subjective. Hence the reason we prefer to use cash and we'll explain that profit is subjective because different accounting policies are used and you can manipulate them. And so cash is, let's think of it as certain, whereas profits are subjective. So do you now understand that, Lucy? <laughs> More than I did, yes. <laughs> yeah. So I'm preaching to you all, but you cannot just say, profits versus cash flows, you need to explain what you mean. Otherwise, the examiner can't give you the mark. Brilliant. Thank you, Joe. OK, we've got a few more um, exam approach type questions. This is, well, this is more a, a kind of technique question, I guess. So we've had a few um, people asking this, um, just asking whether they can use the IRR function. Oh, yes, absolutely. So if you go on the practice platform and you go into the formula help, there is a help function, so a list of all the functions that you are able to use in the practice platform in the spreadsheet area. 
And one of them is the IRR function and one is the net present value function. Now, word of warning, the IRR function is very easy to use because you just highlight the cash flows that you want to find the IRR for and then put in a guess for the um, discount rate. But if you're going to use it for the net present value calculation, then you need to remember that it, you're only adding up the cash flows from year one onwards. The cash flow from year zero, which is effectively the investment, then needs to come off that net present value. I know it sounds weird, but the net present value only calculates the present value of the cash flows from year one onwards. So therefore, you put that formula in, highlight the cash flows from year one onwards, and then underneath that, you take the investment cost at time zero off to get to the full net present value. Practice it. It's, it's, it will get equal marks either way if you're doing it in the Section C spreadsheets. Great. Thank you, Joe. Um, another question we get asked a lot, and I know that you responded to this student directly, but they were asking, I think they were asking specifically about Section B, asking what the examiner's favourite area was for section B. Could you could you kind of reiterate the answer you gave to that and also just comment on the exam as a whole when it comes to um, you know which areas yeah. are examined in which sections and so on? Yeah. So basically the short answer to it is there is a syllabus there for a reason and the whole syllabus is tested. So in section A and B you can get questions on the whole syllabus. There aren't any particular questions that are favoured or not favoured. What, what you've got to realise is the exam has a pool of questions. And when you sit at your computer to sit that exam, you will just get sent a, pool, um, a selection of the questions, which makes sure you have a, a balanced exam, but they could be from any different topic area. So, and then when you get to section C questions, they only come from the working capital section, the business finance section, and the investment appraisal section. But as I said before, there could be 15 different types of topics within those sections that you could get. And um, remember, there's morning exams and afternoon exams. We are a worldwide ACCA. So there are different diets depending on whether you take a morning or an afternoon exam so you again there is a pool of questions so you could be getting a pick of um two di complete different questions to the person who sat next to you and in the afternoon the they can also be getting will be getting a different set of questions because of course we don't you know you can't you can't put the same questions on in the morning as you can in the afternoon because of time zone differences so you have to realize there's a big pool out there and you are going to have to make sure you cover the whole syllabus and practice on the platform. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, a couple more questions um, around more general exam technique approach, and then we'll move on to looking at some technical questions. So, um, right, so this question is asking, so in section C, if, in section C, the students will be presented with either the spreadsheet response area or the word processor response area, depending, I guess, on, on um, whether the question has an emphasis on calculation or, or a discursive type answer. So this student is asking, and we get asked this kind of thing quite a lot, but more in relation to the strategic professional exams, which have a slightly different screen layout. But they're asking that if you've got the spreadsheet response area, um, and obviously you're doing some calculation in there, but the question then also asks you to comment on your findings in some way. They're just checking it's okay, then that you just, you write your narrative part of the answer you know, next to your calculations on the spreadsheet or just underneath or something. Yeah, so that was, that's a classic one. So we, when we did Demorel, did you see that they needed to comment on the um, acceptability of taking the settlement discount? So yeah, that would have been very appropriate to put that comment below um, in the spreadsheet area because the question was asked in the spreadsheet area. It said basically comment whether you should accept it or not. So don't just say yes, which is what that, candidate did, you need to say, yes, this is acceptable on financial grounds because the settlement discount offers a greater return than have uh, than the cost of lost of cost than the lost um, financing cost. So basically, 
you are expected to write a full sentence in that comment and it will be appropriate to put it in the uh, spreadsheet area. The a similar question I've had in the past to that though is where you have um, some analysis in the spreadsheet and then you go to the next question and you want to refer to that analysis in the spreadsheet. Um, and so I, I think, well, going through some of the past exam questions, there is a couple, I think, which I have seen that. And if that's, a pre if that's, that's quite easy, you can just flick back and forth to pick up figures. Or if it's something that you feel that you need quite a bit of, you could put, pop it into the scratch pad because the scratch pad follows through to the next um, question and it doesn't get um, deleted what's in your scratch pad. If that's something you feel you're going to need, for instance, yeah. Mm. That's good technique to have a go at. Yeah, that's some really good advice. Um, and that's actually just reminding me, um, well, I'll just I'll just emphasise because I, I answered a couple of questions on this um, during the session that just remember that anything in your scratch pad doesn't get marked. Um, so it's a really good idea to use it to kind of give you access to information that you've used in your previous answer, as Joe's just suggesting, but just to make completely clear that um, any workings or anything like that that you were to do in your scratch pad, if you wanted the marker to to have access to those, then they would need to go in your actual um, your actual response areas. Okay, uh, one more question before we look at some of the technical questions that have come through. So we we get asked this a lot in a variety of different ways, but this student is asking whether to be able to pass the exam as a whole, would they need to essentially pass each section of the exam individually? No, I think um, the way um, I've often seen it happen is um, traditionally, I think section B has been quite is quite a hard section. It it is in um, other management accounting exams as well, and um, I think students tend to do um, well in section A, um, and uh, and then you can probably have a bad day in section B as long as you pull up your marks in section C. So you don't have to pass each section, you just have to add up enough marks to pass the whole thing as a whole. So um, that's why I recommend doing A, C, B, because um, you don't want to run out of time on your section C questions, because that's, that's the best chance of getting um, far more than half marks in it because you've got all that chance to write those lovely points where you're going to state and explain and use the scenario, aren't you? <laughs> so yeah, the short answer is no, you don't have to pass each section. You just have to pass the exam as a whole. Thanks, Joe. I've just actually answered a student question and I've tested it out then on the practice platform. So I just want to caveat my answer. So the student was asking whether they would be able to copy something from a spreadsheet response area and paste it into the scratch pad. Um, now, I've just tested that. I said that, yes, you should be able to do that, but I've just tested it and I'm not entirely sure you can. <clears throat> so it just shows that how important it is to, is to practice. So just, you know, test out some of these techniques that you might want to use on the practice platform, um, which does reflect as far as possible the, the real exam functionality. Joe, I don't know if you know whether that works slightly differently in the real exam. Yeah, so um, it depends whether you're on what sort of computer you're on, because if you're on an Apple computer, things are different to if you're on a Windows computer. Um, always use the Chrome um, for the practice platform because that is the most stable. Um, and so I have practiced copying actually from the question into the spreadsheet. So sometimes I'm able to copy a table from the question into the spreadsheet, which has been a good uh, good way of doing it. And that I've done that by doing highlighting um, control C, then control view. Um, when it's in, in the word, uh, the sort of um, the word processor sections, um, it seemed to work in a slightly different way, <laughs> where you could use the copy and paste function in the word processor. So I think the best thing to do is to practice. And um, I'm pretty certain, I'm just clarifying, we don't use Macs in any of the exam centers, do we? Do we use Windows? No, I wouldn't have thought it would be Macs, no. 
it won't be Max. That, so I think the best thing to do is to practice on a uh, on a Windows computer, yeah, rather than um, a Mac. And I think that will be the closest to the exam environment that you can get. Yeah, but if you're going to use the spreadsheet um, functionality, I would uh, sorry the scratchpad functionality. I would um, you know it it wouldn't take too long just to type in some of the questions that you want. Um, so sort of the answers to the questions that you want to take forward. And you may just find it easier just to go back and forth from Excel to um, the word processor, just picking up any figures you need. So um, somebody's asked me, how do we remember the valuation of redeemable, irredeemable shares or bond formulas, et cetera? Well, my top tip for that is what I've always told students is to create yourself a crib sheet and on the left hand, there's lots of formulas to learn for the cost of capital and for business valuations side of the syllabus. And actually, they are often the reciprocal of each other. I basically the cost of equity is a rearranged formula for the dividend valuation model, which you'd use for the business valuation side of the syllabus. So put the two formulas side by side. I know you don't have to necessarily learn that one because that's on the uh, formula sheet. But when you're doing the cost of debt formulas, they're similar. One is cost of debt is similar to that market value of debt formula. It's just the other way around. So basically put them side by side and learn them, um, learn them as a, as a couple. Uh, and that's my top tip. So. I had lots of questions about why didn't I use tax in the um, market value of the bond? Well, that's because it was from the investor's point of view. So we don't take tax into account because they're not a company. They're, um, they're an investor in that um, bond. They're not the company who is issuing the bond, which then would get a tax deduction from corporate finance on the interest that they pay. So because you're valuing the bond from the investor's point of view, you have to take the value based on what the investor gets and they get the full interest pre-tax. So then that's what I would be putting on my crib sheet. I'd be saying, oh, when it's the cost of debt, I need to take tax into account. When it's the valuation of debt, I don't take tax into account. And it becomes easier for you. And in the exam, you can visualize that. I'm a very visual person. So you can visualize that in the exam, um, your piece of paper that you've been looking at for the last week before the exam. So hopefully that's a top tip to use. Um, what else have we got? Um, I've got a question here from question 11. I've just checked what question 11 was in the MCQ section. It was the economic order quantity question. And somebody says they're confused in that it says the company's cost of finance is 10% per annum. Um, wondering what you use that for. Well, it's an economic order quantity model. And the formula for the economic order quantity, as I call it, um, to, um, it's the square root of 2 times CO times D over CH. And the CH is the um, the holding cost per unit of the stock. And if this question says each unit costs eight dollars and the customer company's cost of finance is ten percent per annum, so that remember in the holding cost of stock, the cost of financing that stock has to be taken into account. So we would times the eight dollars by ten percent, and we'd include that with the actual holding cost of inventory, which is 70 cents per unit. So that isn't a distractor, as you thought, that person who's asked the question. It's part of the question. You need to add the finance cost of, of buying the inventory, one unit of inventory, to the actual holding cost of the inventory in the warehouse of 70 cents. So hopefully that's answered that. We've had this a few times. Um, kindly clarify, are we supposed to work with the supplier policy of 30 days or 40 days? Right, so the policy might be 30 days, but we're paying on 40 days. So we're getting 40 days worth of financing out of um, paying our suppliers late. 
so it's the 40 days that you need to take account of when you're doing the drop um, to go down to the 15 days for the settlement discount. And the same applies to trade receivables. If your trade receivables are not paying to terms, which they often aren't, um, it's, it's the fact that you're having to fund those trade receivables and you're not funding the terms, you're funding what they're paying on, which would be the higher 40 days in this case. I've got a question on um, High M Company uh, about, I'm just going to flick to it on my computer here now, sorry, if, excuse me, if it'll take a bit of a while to get to it. And it's, they're asking, why haven't we applied inflation to the incremental fixed costs from year one, I think it is. Well, I rem from Doing this question, if you read note three, it says the fixed cost overheads are 200,000 in year one and they rise at 5% per year. Now, I know what that what the issue is there. Every time you do an MPV question and you apply inflation to the fixed costs, you always start it from time zero. So the first inflation is normally in time one. But uh, this question specifically says, and this is the importance of reading clearly the, re the question, that it's 200,000 in year one. So the first inflation is therefore applied in year two. So you would inflate them up from year two onwards. Um, they've also asked why we are applying inflation to the contribution. Well, contribution is taken as being sales prices minus variable costs. And clearly in the question, it says they're not expected to rise over the life of the project. So there's no inflation on there. There's no specific inflation on those costs. So therefore, we don't inflate them up. Um, the question on working capital investing and financing policy. So students traditionally get confused with this. So working capital investing policy is all about investing in current assets. And working capital financing policy is also is all about how you fund your working capital. So it's looking at whether you're doing short or long term, which is what we did in this question, Demorel. Now, they have similar terminology. So you can have an aggressive investing strategy and an aggressive conserv um, and a conservative investing strategy. And you can have aggressive matching and conservative financing strategy. So that's where the confusion starts or ends, if you want I'm saying. So you have to make sure you're clear on both of those. And obviously, with the financing one, as I said before, you need to be able to explain permanent and fluctuating before you go on and explain those three strategies. With the investing one, you don't need to explain that. You're deciding whether you're going to hold lots of stock, long stock periods, and give lots of um, credit, which would be to our customers, which would be a conservative strategy. Whereas aggressive strategy is where you would be trying to get away with low amounts of stock and low um, credit to customers. Because um, one is a high cost, which would be the conservative strategy, and one would be a low cost, which would be the aggressive strategy. So um, they are similar, but you have to uh, explain them slightly differently. So in question 31, somebody's asked me, how is the probability used to calculate the contribution to the cash flow? Well, this is a real technique that you will be tested quite a lot, especially in net present value questions. They all, they would, they're likely to put in an expected value for one of the cash flows. So in this case, they put it in for contribution, but I have seen it based on sales prices or on variable costs. And what they do is they give you three probabilities and three sets of prices, which relate to each of those probabilities. And what you're doing is finding an expected value, because otherwise you'd have to do three different net present value calculations, which I have seen a student do before. So don't do that, <laughs> find the expected value, by timesing the probability by the value, each probability by the value. And remember, the probability should add up to one or 100%. And then the sum of those will then be the expected value that you then put into your net present value calculation. Hopefully, that's explained that one. I think that's it now, Lucy. 
Lovely, thanks, Jay. So we do just have a couple of minutes left, and we've had a few questions just um, asking. So, how would you recommend? You know, what are your top tips for the last few days, essentially, of of, um, of time available before the exam? One student has also asked, so th it's, this is kind of a follow on question, I suppose, for students who've been doing question practice, doing mocks, if they're scoring between 40 to 50 percent currently on the practice they're doing, are there any tips, particularly for students there that you would give? So general tips for, the, for how to spend the last few days before the exam, yeah. particularly if you're still not quite there on, on the mocks you're doing. I think you've got to decide where you're losing the marks. So um, if you're losing the marks in the MCQ sections, are you losing the marks because you're rushing, falling for those distractors? So that was my top tip. You know, um, I did answer a question where somebody said, oh, we do, do it will take us time to, to work out the distractors too in the exam. No, I didn't mean that. <laughs> I meant in practice find out which ones are the distractors that you could have fallen for or if you did fall for them work out why you fell for them and then obviously learn from it so the mcq sections traditionally um people are rushing through them yeah because they think oh i'll save time and then i can get on to section c rushing is not a good thing because you need to read it carefully and consider it and then read it again and think about it again and recalculate again so that you're certain that you've got the right answer before you move on. So I would actually almost take some time to um, re-go over the ones you got wrong and, and work out why you got wrong and whether you then need to go and do some more questions in a similar area so that you've got that technique home because they do get asked in slightly different ways and you have to be aware of where those little tweaks are. For instance, a classic one is um, come div, um, come div and x div. So um, when you're calculating the cost of equity, reading that question carefully is the div is the price the price x div or come div, uh, because obviously the distractor will be there if you don't get that right or read that correctly. I think if it's a section C problem, um, dissect. I mean, you're marking them yourself, so it's quite difficult. Remember that there is a model answer. So you saw me do those questions earlier and marking that student answer. It's a model answer, not a um, not an answer which you'll, you're expected to achieve necessarily. So think to yourself, have I said it in my own words? Have I explained it well enough? And, you know, think like a, I don't know, it's a difficult thing to say, but think like a child, you know, think that the marker is going, why? Why? Please tell me why. Don't just state, but always try and explain. So when you're defining something, explain the definition. When you're making a statement about this scenario, point write out the point in the scenario that you're making that statement about, relate it to that scenario. And those written marks will improve, definitely. So uh, I think you've got to be critical now of yourself if you're getting between 40 and 50 and go and critically work on the areas which um, need improving. Yeah, definitely. Thank you very much, Joe. And that, that does bring us to the end of the session. Um, so I'd just like to say a huge thanks to Joe for um, all the preparation that went into the, the webinar today, answering lots and lots of questions as the video content was playing. That's fantastic. And we've also managed to cover off quite a lot of questions there in the Q&A at the end as well. Um, and please bear in mind what Joe's just been saying, those tips about really sort of critically assessing how you're performing in your question practice. There is a video to support you if you are studying independently and you're doing question practice and you're having to assess for yourself how you're performing. Please do have a look at our support video for that. That's in the resource list. Um, and remember, you can watch this session again. You'll be receiving an email tomorrow with details on how you can do that. So if you 
if you'd like to just revisit any of Joe's advice, then you'll be able to do that as many times as you like. Okay, so thank you, Joe. Thanks to all of you for taking the time to join us and um, taking the time out of your busy schedules. And thanks for all the questions that you've sent to us. It was great to get your engagement and all the very best for your exams next week. We're wishing you lots and lots of good luck. Thank you.